Welcome to the June 6 Beehive Production User Call. We have Dave, Dan, Rod, Andrew, John, Santiago, Rebecca, and myself, and others are trickling in wonderfully. Uh, let's see. Welcome back, Rebecca. You have an open question about, is anyone interested in AARCH64 EFI EDK2 payload, as I understand it? Go ahead and clarify as you need. Uh, yes. So U-Boot. Um... Qubit has ETA, EFI compatibility, and so when you use U-Boot to boot through BSD, it actually boots in UEFI mode. Um, but my question is, if anyone wants a full ETA2 implementation, which adds some features like network boot, etc., that um, I don't think U-Boot has. Network boot would be awesome. This is like the HTTP boot type thing, you mean? Uh, sorry, a second. Is this the the, the HTTP type boot where from uh, the BIOS you can the firmware you can directly boot FreeBSD over HTTP two? Or, yes. Um, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, that, that's fa fantastic. I've, I've I've used it a little bit on um, AMD sixty four, and um, my main issue has actually been the size of TLS certs getting too big for the very first packets. Um, but um, yeah, this would be something I would love to see and use all the time. Awesome. Okay, I can work on that. Um, does you would already support any kind of chain loader like IPXE to uh, do a basically a chain boot from a read-only block device uh, into a second stage and then uh, HTTP boot? I don't know. Um, and my use case would be uh, if I ever get to play around with Beehive on ARM64, I would like to keep VidIO SCSI as a boot option. I don't know if U-Boot has support for a uh, full SCSI initiator. Hey, Rebecca, I posted a link into a, this is a full-blown AR64 ED2K port to the Rock 3588. Oh yes, I think I've used that actually. Yeah, it's I mean it's a full blown implementation. It's got some rough edges, like it doesn't support anything, but but um uh, what's the GUI the graphic size now? It's got a restriction, it only supports one display size for your um Oh right, yes. Yeah, it's it's gotta be 1080p 60 hertz is the only display mode it supports. Um, I think the uh, USB code that's in that is kind of broken in that it only supports the USB 3 ports on my hardware. The USB 2 ports won't work. Um, right. So, yeah, I'd be starting from scratch. I, I'd be starting from a different project, probably the um, QEMU SBSA port in upstream ETK2 platforms. Um, I think that's probably the best starting point for okay, you're gonna, Beehive. So you're going to, you're building this for Beehive only? Yes. Yeah, be a port of, um, yeah, be a port of um, the QEMU code for Beehive. Okay. Does that raise any licensing issues? Uh, I don't think so. It's all uh, BSD plus patent uh, license licenses. Oh, cool. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, except for the x86 emulator, which is LGPL, um, but everyone has to deal with that. Understood. And isn't the boot ROM cleanly isolated from the rest of Beehive by being just a blob? Uh, it's the what? The EFI payload blob is the EFI payload does not become that, part but... of the beehive source code, it's a blob from the point of your beehive. Oh, uh, yes, yes. I think so. so. As long as you can get the blob in a way which works for your licensing constraints, it's correct. So it's not like it has to be compiled into the kernel or something like that. Oh, oh no, not at all. Yeah. Speaking While we got way. you here, Rebecca, I know one thing that you have this information, and I would love to see it documented somewhere, and that's what the 
constraints and requirements are for building a binary that loads as boot ROM. Because there was some there, I don't know if there if it's clearly documented anywhere that what link addresses you have to have, what it's going to start up at, and what what your mode is, and what your resources are. Ooh, okay, uh, yeah. Just a just a very simple one page document that says here's all the parameters because given that set of information, there's you can build standalone blobs. Yes. Um, yeah. I uh, think having the ability to build standalone blobs to run in BI would be really useful. Um, that ties neatly into the next question I have, which is, has anyone uh, heard about progress with regards to KXEC for FreeBSD? No. Uh, sorry, just yes. go back to the previous line. Uh, standalone blobs. No. Basically, compiling stuff so that you can just run it as a boot ROM, maybe a complete kernel, I assume. Maybe a kernel with, uh, with a read only memory file system included so that you don't need a storage device at all. Or what is your use case? Very good. Hey, exec in itself has quite different requirements than a Beehive standalone blob. K exec is going to do a, a um, Linux loader type start of a, of an image so you need to you need your image needs to be in multi-boot format or something like that they call it they've got a name for it and that's that's the expected environment of anything k execs going to load i thought i saw a message in one of the previous emailing lists so we john you're pretty quiet sorry to interrupt I thought I saw someone... Still very quiet. Can you adjust your mic? Chew on it. Chew on it. Yep, ride that. Can you hear me better? Not much, but you, we, you can try. Uh, might be hard I for the recording. I thought there was a mailing list entry about a, a kernel loader option for, free, for Beehive a week or two ago. Well, the one I know of is the one by Chuck Toothley to try and get CBIOS working, and it was a thread, little thread between, I think, him and John. Uh, so, yeah, CBIOS is the, um, what's it called? It's the legacy 32-bit BIOS compatibility mode, um, CSM, isn't it? Yep. Uh, no. Or no. pre that. <laughs> The the CSM is a usually I believe a vendor built add on to 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 ED two K ED two K doesn't come with a, a any any functional CSM uh, on X eighty six on. Oh, let's see, on OVFF it does, it used to. Um, it basically, they used to build CBIOS, I think, and have that as a CSM. Uh, that's why I mentioned that. Okay. Um, but they officially removed CSM support uh, last year. Oh, okay. From ED2K, right? It has yeah. no CSM anymore at all. Right. Huh. But you could still... In theory, write an option one which implements a BIOS without any UEFI. And that's what if Chuck you really wants want to do. do that. That's that's what Chuck wants to do. Chuck wants to be able to load C BIOS as a direct payload using the boot ROM equals. Ah, okay, that's different. Yeah, and we, he played with it some, and the problem was we could never get it to to spit anything out anywhere. I got a feeling it was probably linked at the wrong address or was assuming that the CPU was in the wrong mode. Because I think we actually, when you start up a beehive, the first executed instruction is as, as if you did a power on reset and you're in real mode at FFFF zero. Yes, yeah, it'd, it'd be booting in, uh, booting as a x86 system. So it'll be, yeah, booting up in real mode. Then you have to um, set up all the, GDT, etc., and jump into long mode, and then etc. Do all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, it would be it would be really useful to have the you know the fact that you documented that Beehive starts in real mode. It's is it starts it at this instruction pointer and um because let's see in real mode you're gonna have a segment register and a and a IP value set of values so that you would be sure that you linked your code correctly to be expecting that condition. Uh, Rebecca, is that something you know enough about to maybe do some napkin notes on or wiki page or some form of docs? I, not many people have had had their feet that wet with such code. <laughs> Ooh. Um, yeah, this is going back about, what, 25 years now. <laughs> um, I was playing with that under DOS. And yeah, I could certainly see if I can get, find some time to figure it out and put some well, documentation I'm together. Is what I'm thinking is is the ED2K work that you did for Beehive already has to have that information in it. That ED2K has to have a startup routine and the the link addresses and everything have to be in the make files. Sure. Um, yeah, I can. I guess I can dig it out and have a look at the PEI, which is the pre UEFI stage. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, um, if you change long mode to protected mode, um, yeah, that's, I've got ah. the naming of it. Wait, it's been decades, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, it starts up in, sorry, it starts up in 16-bit mode that boots it, jumps into protected mode, which is 32-bit. Then it goes to long mode, which is 64-bit. That's right. Yeah, that's what I was missing. Wow. That help, Rod? <laughs> Yep. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, the big thing was is to confirm that we're still starting in real mode, sixteen bit real Can mode. You... Yes, because you have to make all. Generally, you have to use NASM and and make some pretty hard assumptions about what the values of things are, and particularly what your starting um, segment register value and instruction pointer value are going to be, because you have to. Uh, almost all real hardware BIOSes. The first instruction is a jump. To to a lower lower place in the ROM because the start address is the very top of the ROM. And so you've got to jump backwards to the beginning of the ROM and then you gotta set up tables and everything else to to switch to protected mode. Right. Yeah, this is slowly coming back but to me now. <laughs> the thing is, there, there's no document in, that says that Beehive, when it, it initializes execution, here's what your state is. Right. Yeah, because um, I think Intel is now pushing towards um, booting, starting up in 32-bit mode. Um, so, yeah, we need to dig in and figure it all out. And and I actually, I think there's an exception there that if you use the Beehive, um, Beehive load, that actually loads the memory and... But without a valid uh, GDT, you probably triple fault and reboot, right? Well, I think it mocks, it mocks with some state and because it launches, if I'm not mistaken, it launches the, the FreeBSD kernel in 64-bit long mode, just like the loader does. You got to realize the FreeBSD kernel itself is a long mode e executable. But does it have a non-long mode entry point? No. Because you used to be able to just blot the kernel somewhere and then have it come up without... Or did you need the, or was the code just in the master boot worker? It's in the loader. That? It's in the loader. You could skip the loader historically. Not Not a long time. time. I haven't done it in ages, and I'm not sure if it was a 32 or 64 bit system the last time I did it. Yeah, I'm almost sure now that Beehive load actually starts Beehive. Oh already preset to long 64-bit mode and the kernel's ready to go. 
so basically there's no reason not to do one thing or another and make it make it optional and um okay. answer your question, you can definitely single step before the first instruction uh, on Illumos. I not thought sure. so that that should be possible. At worst, you would have to use the um, use the um, VNC server to hold it, and then basically connect the debugger first, and then connect the VNC client. But I th should be possible to just create it and not start the first instruction with behave control, right? Well, you can. I don't know, but you, you can definitely do it with, with MDB on Lumos. Just attach to, to the VM before it starts and get to see the initial state of the CPU. But that really, uh, given how this is implemented, uh, the initial state can be everything that you want it to be. And of course, it makes sense for it to be something that mirrors what actual real hardware would do. So there's more one more than one way to boot a cat. Um, well, uh, is there any form of tracing of the virtual machine, be it trust, be it detrace, that would help answer some of these questions and just give you like visual transparency into it? Or no, it's just a lot of experimentation based on things you learned in the 80s. Um, I think it would be best to probably look at what uh, EDK2 does because um, it has the start addresses in the F in the flash file and uh, yeah, you can look at all the code oh, cool. it generates and stuff. Cool. Yeah, I think you might be able to do something with GDB because I, if I'm not mistaken, that can actually, you can get the GDP attached before the first instruction executes. But you also have to know how to tell GDB what mode the CPU is in, because it will get very confused, I think, if it doesn't know that. I was going to say that. Um, yeah, <laughs> GDB can't inspect the CPU and know what mode it's in. You have to know that beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I There's seem to no remember this control having register that. to inspect. <laughs> No. Damn. <laughs> um, I guess I will briefly touch on, take a look at Rob Norris's quiz talk. He has a good blog post. I believe that's on the call notes from yesterday from ZFS. Um, I know, uh, let's see, John Baldwin, of course, and Mark Johnson are looking at all things debugging on Beehive, which is nice. And also from BSD Can, there was the antithesis determinator. The determinator is a stripped down uh, deterministic single CPU hypervisor for chasing down bugs. So that's a fascinating one. And Rodney, with any luck, you'll get your time travel out of it. I brought that up when they mentioned it. And then I immediately saw the, yeah, I the author Max and Mark and John all talking. I'm, I hope good things happen. Go ahead, Rod. Yeah, I do not believe that that will help me any in the time travel or at all. That does okay. Some, well, they're messing that, with the... It does some really interesting other things, but I don't think it's going to help with the time travel problem. Right, but they were injecting a clock and tinkering with it like as they please. So, yeah, anyway. Uh, Rebecca, what you got here? You've got OVMF's goodies. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so I just found the reset oh. vector um, assembly code, and it's um, including like real 16 to flat 32, then flat 32 to flat 64, et cetera. So oh, um, yeah, I think that's kind of what we're looking for. Right. Do you see that on screen? Yeah, <laughs> I do. Okay, cool. So cool. Uh, I've nudged Chuck, no answer. Oh, no, he, Chuck has not touched it recently, so that wouldn't have been on the mailing list recently. Do you recall the mailing list, John, where you saw a mention of that? I've 
been looking, haven't found oh, it yet. No worries. Good man looking for the, the link. Always have your links ready. Okay. Uh, any other boot topics? And oh, about uh, quiz, which let me grab that link. Uh, Rob was tired of having his host blow up when doing OpenZFS development. So he first on Linux and now on FreeBSD has a, a stripped down interface such that the thing he's working on becomes a transparent user facing like binary that he can control C quit even though it's in a hypervisor. So I have a talk, a paper here that I can link. So that was fascinating and may take another angle at the same challenge. Other boot topics. This is a great discussion with a lot of actual meat. Uh, so moving on, uh, let's see, uh, Dave, because we touched on, oh, Ed, but I'll look fine. Uh, Jan, you, had, you were watching GVTD, uh, I will be thinking on some more GPU pass through, but is that something you have tried, something you want? No. Nope. Okay. Just something I stumbled over while looking for the mentioned uh, mail. Got it. Dave, you're having trouble with your Ampere EMAG. Do all of us know if that is or is not a supported AARC64 system with Beehive? It should be. It's got the JIC V3. Um, Michael Tuxen reported the same thing. If you carefully load VMM, it it doesn't even panic. It just, I don't know what you call it, I guess like a machine machine check. It just reboots automatically. Yeah. There's something. So I'm happy to run more stuff to get some sort of debugging out. I just don't know what one does at that level when, when the system I'm just gives you a straight up finger. If I'm not mistaken, Michael Tuxen owns one of those. And yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. Mark Johnson has access to one that's, that's foundation owned. So the, the EMAG should be well supported. If we're having a problem on the EMAG, are you running the most recent snapshots? Uh, this one is probably now a week and a half old, I guess. Okay, well, it's, yeah, and I'm really that's pretty good. Today, so, uh, the, probably by the end of the fall, I'll tell you how bad it is. Yeah, yeah there, I do know that there was a, a several messages about problems on EMAG machines with either VMM causing a panic on load sporadically all the way to can't get it booted. Um, yeah. So all right. uh, I'll do a bugzilla for that probably and, and, and let Michael know as well. Yeah, I'd get a bug report open and, and the right people should stick their heads up and go, oh, yeah, we we either they know about that or you've got a new one. The other thing would be to make sure all your firmware and stuff is updated. Yeah, that is that is kind of tricky on these. Um, on my one, it looks like I, I may need to replace the NIC, which is apparently giving some weird errors, which is new. So uh, maybe I should do this without that NIC in it. So Rod, as we collectively build a list of things that boot without much intervention with Beehive Arm, is your orange pie treating you well or not yet? Or you have no. No, it's not treating me well at all with, with Beehive. Got it. Other than that one success, I've been able to not get any further successes with getting Beehive to run a gas. Oh, it was like literally one time. I got one VM to run one time. Uh, Rebecca, can you think of a circumstances in which that might happen? It w I do recall this from a previous call. That's uh, sorry, I missed that. I wasn't paying attention. Oh, no worries. Uh, there's, so, go ahead, there, Rod. There are so many variants and stuff that I that isn't even enough data for anybody to think about what may be going okay. wrong. So, well, yes, but at a high level, what might cause a, a VM to work successfully once and then never ever again? I have no idea. No worries. The problem, the problem is, is the machine state when it worked is unknown. So yeah. Nope. Whatever. If I can't duplicate it, I'm not sure the heck is expecting no, anybody just else. To high be level. Able to just know high level. It. No, I'm not cornering it's, it. It's completely off the question table. Yeah, but we want it to work. Okay. So moving on. Um, let's see. Let's see. We've had Chris and Daniel join among others. 
Santiago, you might be pressed for time. I'd love to hear maybe about your NIC issues and a broader question. Do we know if if Kib's IOMMU work is going? I've only heard the broad statement. The foundation is sponsoring that work, but I did a quick search of Fayfresh BSD and I'm not seeing anything. So uh, any news, any ideas, any anything? And I'm dropping in quiz links. There's um, an article and there is his GitHub repo. Was that uh, Dan? I heard a voice. No, that was that was me, Chris. Uh, uh, sorry, Chris, I uh, didn't mean to uh, interrupt. No worries. Um, I've got I've got um actually two I've got two questions. Um, and actually I um I put mine at the bottom because I don't want to jump the queue, so to say. Um, um, I um. I did recently try two particular things. The first thing I tried is I um, I was looking at making a free PSD guest with a read-only root partition. And I did that basically not just by FS tab, our old flags, but also by adding the our old flag in the, in the disk argument. Basically, at the at the end of the um, dash s whatever vert I O block, and then the disk image comma r o. Uh, so I made it also read only from beehives, uh, basically from the hypervisor perspective. And as soon as I do that, the guest is unable to boot. So the loader basically fails with a, a message that it is unable to to load further beyond, I think, boot one, I think. Yeah. Have you tried the uh, mount conf? Random. Sorry, say it again, please. Uh, have you tried the slash dot mount dot conf file? It could, uh, I'm wondering if what's happening is that the kernel tries to mount the file system or if it's that the loader tries to do things like cle clean the uh, boot once flag or something. The thing is, it doesn't even reach the kernel. Um, as a matter of fact, I entered the, I, I entered the bootloader um, because I see the bootloader menu and I think I did see that. Um, I believe I did say that I'm actually not completely sure if I even I know I don't I think I don't even get to the menu I think. Okay. Do you get an error message at all? Well, the error message is something that uh, failed to um, fail to fail to uh, what was it? Um, failed to load. I, unfortunately, I forgot to copy the the error message. Failed to boot. Failed to load boot zero zero one or something like that. I think it falls back into a, a bootloader prompt. And when I look at the available disks, it does not see the disk, which makes absolutely no sense to me. That boot 001 looks like the um, um, the yes, firmware if I boot, if I boot manager type entry. Um, yeah. But the read only really stuff is that you got I know that um, Alan Jude has done work or, um, to get um, FreeBSD booting off a ZFS snapshot read-only, I think a read-only snapshot, um, but that's much later. So mm -hmm. we're going to start much, much earlier than that. Um, the what... thing is, what I find weird, as soon as I remove the RO, everything goes back to work and works again. Mm. So in that uh, definitely it's something it's with the RO like flag. Yeah. Have you tried uh, to use um, other storage types, like, for example, a SATA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried NVMe. I tried NVMe as well. Yeah. yeah. The, the ones which code expects to be read only, like a CD image. Ah, OK. No, I have not tried that. No. So I because of that, that, I said SATA CD. <laughs> so that, or even uh, yeah. And for what it's worth, have you tried leaving it air quotes writable, but then putting it on putting it on a read only data set in ZFS? I did not try that either. No, that would also be interesting. You're right. 
I know that I used at least used to be able to boot from uh, read only uh, disk like LUNs with it as SCSI in 13.2. Hmm. Um, That'd be pretty nice. Yeah, that, that'd be that'd be really cool to try that. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna try. The, I'm try it up. If someone wants to, uh, <laughs> it's prepared to look at a scripting language which is uh, fairly esoteric. I have the stuff so that it sets up um, Z vaults and uh, CTL ports safely, so with a LAN map, so that each guest gets its own CTL port, and the CTL port then gets a LAN map assigned uh, before anything is done with it, so that Beehive can only access the, the, um, the, the SCSI LANs it's supposed to see on the port, so that the guest doesn't see all the LANs which are registered with the come target layer. That each mm. guest only gets to see its own. You can resize and hot plug and unplug uh, yep. virtual disks using CDL admin, but um, it doesn't generate for hot plug events. On hot unplug, of course, you will quickly notice then there's an error, it rescans, and so it's noisy, but it works. Hot pl uh, plug, unlike hot unplug, doesn't generate an error. So you kind of either have to inject one so that it the guest is, uh, rescans the bus, or you have to manually rescan the bus or just wait long enough so that something mm. eventually will notice, maybe, but yeah. Mm. Or you would have to use some kind of guest agent where you just, uh, uh, vidio console port, just tell her to please rescan your buses. Mm. That's the way cheaper and the thing that's what QEMU expects. And then Jan, did you set read only with CTL? Yes, with at the cam layer or at the, the Zvol level, both works because it's uh, the important part is you can boot at least the UEFI and bootloader used to work in 1302. I haven't tried it in 14 on the guest. Oh, the host okay. was 14 already, but the guest was not, I think. Well, Chris, I hope that helps. Do you have other topics? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Great, 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 great. And input. Give us use case we may not have imagined for read only boot. Well, uh, I was actually um, attempting to reconstruct something that is very common with jails, where you have uh, base and read only, and um, everything on top is then basically read rate. And with this, I could potentially reuse the root disk for other virtual machines, save the disk space, and you know up upgrade uh, a base image by just replacing the root disk. Ah, talk to Jan about that. He has a number of uh, There's something okay. else for you because uh, FreeBSD 14.1 has a very stripped down cloud in it, uh, basically agent built in. It's written in uh -huh. Lua and there's an RC.d script for it. And it can basically look at a device so that you already have a way in the base system that you can use to just pull in a configuration from a, a ISO files or FAT file system. Mm -hmm. Cool. And right. uh, the most flexible, but also the most fragile and complex way to use it is to run a user data shell script. So that it basically auto mounts the file system and runs a script as root from there. That's a path user data. You don't, yeah, I think it's uh, user data inside the file system. And okay. if it's executable and starts with a shebang line. Oh, okay. so I haven't okay. read that the whole code yet. I have the check. Okay. Uh, are there any like VM state D news? Uh, not at the moment because um, basically all my tests. Um have been keeping me busy. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a, a, a second case that I want to run by you guys because what I tried as well was um, I attempted pixie booting a guest. Um, and and I didn't I didn't manage to get it to work. And I'm, I was wondering, has anyone ever, any one of you guys tried that? 
So you did get it working, correct? I, I did not. I did not get it to work. I, again, I ran into issues with with loader, unfortunately. Michael and myself have both had pixie booting of Beehive guests working since thirteen something. Long okay. ago. I think what was one your of basic the, uh, networking uh, setup? PXE perhaps? payloads from the port tree has a, a one which the thing is, an option worm you're me... normally supposed to load into a, a NIC if you really want to burn your custom firm. And there has been a report that it can work in Beehive so that you can directly boot into a, that as an option worm. Well, the thing is, it, I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to basically just use a virtual network device and, and no physical one. And, and it, um, what I have set up, what I have set up is basically it is it is able to boot, uh, get the Pixie boot um, loader via TFTP that actually works. So DHCP and everything is is apparently also working. But as soon as Pixie boot is loaded, then um, then basically it's 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 over. The NFS server is never contacted. It is not making any attempt to mount anything, and it is not loading loading the kernel either. Um. So you were. You you basically died at the end of loading slash boot slash exactly. Yes. Oh, I know what that is. You need go get the PXE boot file from um what's the magic version, Michael? Um oh. uh, uh, I had I had, actually I found one I found one from Peter Solaski. Is that the one? No, I got um, shit. Um, I, shit. Let me um yeah, I guess I could rummage around a file system and look for it. I, I got Yeah, I got to find where I got that stuff. <laughs> that right now, but yeah, you need a very. It's it's from a FreeBSD release, but it's from an okay. old release. It's from oh, really? old something or, um, I just. I All can't right, even, that is interesting. I okay. can't even um, think right now where my Pixie boot is at, um, <laughs> because I can, um, I can I can come up with the file. I can't tell you exactly where it came from. Um, the pull of the back of a truck did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, um, what? Hey, Chris, I've I've got I've done some work on this like a couple of years ago, so I'll, I'll okay. run it and see if it goes. I wasn't using NFS. Um, I just wanted to boot remotely, um, mm -hmm. and I think it was HTTP boot. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll send a link to my docs from that and. Um, all right. Well, maybe the time, the same, time, the same time zone. I'm happy to have a crack at that together with you um, at some point. Yeah. Uh, the IPXE port installs a bunch of different uh, ROM images, and you don't need any of the ROM images from IPXE. There is IPXE. Pixie is built into the Beehive EFI implementation. Yes, but if I remember correctly, the uh, EDK2 has terribly slow HTTP boot. Because IPXE yeah, loads much. bigger images, which include a root file system in reasonable time. Whereas the other one is so slow, it's not funny. Hmm. At least on real hardware, it is. Uh, which is why I once prototyped that out with using the EDK2 um, boot peaks e code only to, or HTTP boot code to chain load a better HTTP boot loader, just because you don't want to fetch a few hundred megabytes with the other one. Because it used to load even on a 10 gig NIC with less than one megabyte per second. Yeah, I, I think the one in Beehive doesn't have HTTP built into it. Rebecca would know that, but um, uh, sorry, a second. John has a good question. The, the I do not believe that the PXE that we're building into the ED2K ROM has HTTP support, or did that get turned on? Um, I don't know if it's on by default, but it yeah. can be built to be enabled. And John has a question. How are you specifying the root FS when doing that, Chris? Uh, so basically, um, I tried it. I tried it two ways, actually. I tried it. And, um, 
by first getting an NFS handle and specifying loader parameters. So I tried that without actually Pixie. That did not work. That's when I actually switched to Pixie. And uh, with Pixie, I basically just have the the server and IP a uh, server and mount point. I have that NFS path basically. But that is but the, the whole route is basically on an, on the NFS server. Well, either way, actually, it's on the on, on the NFS server. The UCP options, yeah, they they actually work. I did confirm that. I had a Wireshark. Uh, I I um I uh, ran TCP thump, uh, checked the thump in Wireshark, and actually confirmed that all the options are there. So the guest is definitely receiving them, but um, yeah, it is not it is not going beyond the the stage after loading Pixie Boot binary from the TFTP. Has anyone else made progress on that, or do you desire it should connect with Chris? Basically, actually, uh, what I should probably add, um, I'm actually specifying the routes for uh, for the guest via the DHCP option. It's, it's, it's in there. I cannot remember which option it is, but I, I know it's in there. Mm. Oh, good, John. Good point. Man, disk. Actually, that that I followed that. Yeah, oh, that, that's okay, good. I, I did follow that, that except for the DH uh, because that the man disk class actually recommends not using the DHCP option, but I think boot p somewhere it, it uh, suggests using boot p. But I just uh, installed the IC DHCP and put everything in there. Hmm. And did you use like e pair networking or something? Because that can be tricky about having a meaningful. Um, not in this case. See what you're actually. trying to look for. Okay. And Jan, I'm sure, has some insights. Okay. Well, I'll keep us posted. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah of course. This is, if you want to go completely crazy, you can also try the IS boot uh, support. For ICE, well, one know. thing, one thing I tried, and one thing I tried additionally because uh, that that is the. The stuff that I mentioned uh, from Hans Peter Solaski, that he posted something on the FreeBSD forums where he mentioned that Pixie Boot might fail because it is too large, the Pixie Boot version, and uh, he recommended removing the CFS uh, stuff if you don't need it. And because my guest is actually, uh, well, not using CFS because it is supposed to load from an NFS share, um, I tried that as well, but it actually did not work either. So. Oh. There sure is, a, is any help. Um, has some guidance uh, in, hidden in the I think default kernel configurations, uh, which option you have to bump to uh, support a bigger uh, MFS road. That's hmm. the issue you're hitting. But you're right. If it's you not, have the memory layout, not an layout, MFS road issue. He's not loading an MFS image. Okay. Because was that the, old the other issue you can run 70. into that uh, you don't have enough of the right kind of low memory range available to have the PXIE uh, firmware load the whole kernel because it's just running out of, if it's running in low enough mode, basically it runs out of address space, which it can address. Or it collides with some uh, allocation, which is in array, so that it cannot linearly uh, Lay it out in physical memory from the starting address it picks. So yeah, maybe try a tiny little minimal kernel config or something. But that at least should get you an error message. Hmm. I see Devin Teske had Pixie config. That I tried at one point. Uh, Druid BSD Pixie config. Uh, I'll try to see if this is still I, about. The big problem with the old Pixie stuff is that it's usually um, um, MBR era and none ah. of the stuff works anymore. Fair enough. Um, yeah, but it's totally worth getting a go. Um, there's this link. We talked about it in the uh, jails call mm, this week, I think, or the week before. Um, from Antronig about oh. not the right link, um, 
about doing Ipixie Boot and Vulture, but he did it directly to um, uh, like an MFS BSD image, and you could just sand boot it over the network, and that's pretty damn awesome. Um, how does how does MBR come into the PXE boot situation at all? Um, um, it, it makes it like tricky. Yeah. There you go. Go ahead. Yeah. So the question uh, is, um, do you boot EFI uh, basically firmware and then it runs on top of EFI using the EFI boot services, or does it do everything basically on its own as an option ROM? Is it uh, in an old-fashioned BIOS? in 18 or whatever. If it does the latter, um, the problem is that it can clobber the EFI. Uh, and then basically the EFI boot services are fighting with the option where I'm the PXE. Yeah. So if you really try to use a, a, a an old fashioned bias PXE option room for uh, together with UEFI, but I don't even know if you can do that on um, Beehive, you can do it, and it doesn't work on real hardware. Well, I um, I just uh, I just went with the, the with the Pixie boot from the boot directory that is recommended from the handbook, I think, if I remember correctly. Does the handbook um, meant to be or just systems in general? No, that's that's the thing. It's okay. all, all the Pixie related stuff that you find or that I found on the internet was really about uh, booting physical systems. Absolutely. So um, that's probably that's probably making the whole thing a little bit more um, difficult, you know, to um, to actually understand why this is breaking. But um, I expect that it, it is something that I'm doing wrong, obviously. So any other going from hardware boot to network boot. Any other points or questions? Well, just the comment that on a hypervisor like Beehive, you have other options. So you can actually manage it from the host. For example, uh, use video SCSI to attach to disk instead of using uh, iSCSI boot. So uh, I found it less painful to move what's possible uh, on of the management tasks into the host instead of trying to do it all inside the guest. But yeah, it depends which part works for you. Thank you, right. Rebecca. Thanks for dropping in. Cool. Um, I will look for a... Yeah. There's one last thing I'd like to add, which was Marius's um, NFS handle work, because that that was one of the missing links that the loader didn't handle at one point long, long ago. But hey, it's maybe academic. Okay, moving on. Santiago, how are you and how is your SRIOV environment handling you? John's kind of Hello. Oh, thank you, Dave. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Excellent. Uh, no, the same. So with the Broadcom Nix, it's, uh, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah. It just randomly stop working. If you change something, if you disable TSO, LRO, it just breaks a, breaks a nick. So I tried today in 14.1, then I tried on main. It's the same story. Something is wrong, how those cards are being programmed. Um, yeah, I need to spend more time on it. Um, but yeah. I'm more on the on the phase of getting rid of those cards and putting some Intel that they work, or some Melanox, or perhaps Chelsea or or, or Melanox, indeed. Yeah, um, or Chelsea or whatever. Have any of your problem reports seen movement? No, not really. But uh, the other the other thing we need to find out is if just just me having this, or I don't know, guys, if you have around the DB and ex the Broadcom Nicks, if you can give it a try. But if it's just me, oh. then you may be the only one with the exact combination of host uh, yeah. CPU chipset and NIC. Firmware. But there have yeah. been several reports of issues on second and third generation EPIC and PCI pass through in general, where it works uh, for seconds to days and then it explodes and just the host hangs and yeah. 
Yeah, this this one is or more just on the, the guest yeah, starts just... working for some, I think. So the on the previous the um, Bugzilla, there are several reports uh, of that, and the, the okay, okay. foundation mentioned working on a better uh, I/O MMU driver for um, modern AMD CPUs. Is it finishing it? But yeah. Yeah, the, this specific issue is, is not related to PCI path through. It's, it's even just on the on the host device, on the host um, uh, node, uh, that the, the 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 driver is not stable at all. Like I don't have even the luxury to pass through those those things. Yeah, Interesting. Broadcom is a NDA hellhole, <laughs> so uh, you're probably best off ripping out the card if you Correct. can. And, yeah. and getting something which is documented. Yeah, that's that's what I'm heading, John. You're right. Yeah. Um, I hope your boss can get you some hardware. <laughs> I generally Broadcom <laughs> as a policy, more so than ever. So anyway, just saying. Uh, and John, you shared some information on validating your Linux guest that's environment. Good. I'm guessing. Okay, uh, John. Uh, Santiago, other news? Any positive, exciting news in your network, your lab? Yeah, we're building new lab in Madrid with more hardware that hopefully we can use also to do some tests on FreeBSD. Um, yeah, hopefully it will be online soon. Um, apart from that, as I told you, um, Michael, I, I was doing some changes to ping utility to add the, the FIV option to be able to set the FIV when you are pinging and not just doing set FIV and then ping, blah, blah, blah. So my C skills are horrible, so I will send you the code uh, just to see how bad it is. It's FIB like, so... fib, is that right? Or something else? Sorry? Uh, what's that? Yeah, the fib. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For... Yeah, so I, I just use a minus F. That is the same that is being used at the moment when you use root or when you use netstat. Uh, you can pass minus F in capital letter, and then you can specify the number of fib. Ah. Got it. You can let's say you have twenty fibs on your node, and then you can put minus f in capitals, and then ten or whatever, and then you you can ping from that specific. The so FID is limited to four bit, or has it been bumped to more than uh, sixteen possible fibs? I'm running with twenty, so. Um, okay, so uh, should be fine. Been, uh, padding bits the last time. Yeah, that's a good question, man. We, we can give it a try and see where where we are. Yeah. Because it used to be that the uh, FIP uh, index was just squished into four uh, spare bits. Okay. But if you're running with 20, obviously the size has grown. Which is good. <laughs> yeah, but it would be nice to see what is the limit there. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Are there any C coders who might want to look at that? Sorry, I didn't jump in. Oh, I don't know. Uh, let's see. You John. don't have to know much C. You can basically just try powers of two until it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Well, that's exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now that we have a different group than we started with, uh, Rod was trying to add a UFS data partition to hybrid ISO images just so that it's like i guess mounted locally at a partition ideally but he found that the hybrid nature got it kind of confused uh, does anyone have some insights into mangling work, of images my workaround for that in creating yep. a partition table to cover the rest of the iso storage has in fact worked oh during the um, call couldn't you use the and mount file to create an MD out of a file on the ISO and then mount that as your root? That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Oh, so, Rod, you, so you, you want, want a working workaround? Uh, uh, you want Rod, tell us, I want to catch up right a there. Hybrid ISO, which works both as an ISO and as a disk image. It, 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 Do you lose you... A, one of the other abilities of the hybrid? Just I, I support that question. <laughs> as far as I know, no. Okay. And you do have a working workaround? 
Yes. Ah, can you describe that briefly or type it in? Well, I, you basically have to create, after you write the hybrid FreeBSD image to your memory stick, first thing you do is do a GPART recover on it to get the GPT corrected for the fact that the image you downloaded doesn't match the size of your stick. And so you have to correct the second, the location of the second GPT copy. So yep. a G part recover fixes that, the thing quits complaining about your stick. That doesn't do any harm. Then you need to do a G part add of a properly sized bogus partition to cover the data used by the ISO. Because the problem is, is the ISO 9660 file system is not covered by the GPT table that's written to the to the uh, memory stick. Ah, so you create this bogus entry that will cover the rest of that data, and then you just add whatever you want on the end of the stick. So if you've got like if you write our our 1.2 gigabyte um, hybrid to a 32 gig stick, you got 30 gig of unused space on the end of it that you, that you can now use. But you have to create that bogus entry to cover the ISO, or you will just you will corrupt the data in the ISO. Arguably, this should be covered by the hybrid creation process. We should be creating a GPT that covers the data area that's in use. Because it's just too easy to corrupt one of these sticks. But I've I've done an install now with that, and my data files are fine in that second partition. The original stuff all passes, manifest checksums, and so um, no data corruption. The only thing I don't know is if I can still boot in MBR mode, because right now I'm doing all my work in EFI. So I don't know okay. if it's damaged the ability to do an MBR boot from it, but that's that's pretty easy for me to test. How um, did you determine the size of the ISO portion of it? It's the size of the ISO. Well, so it shows up in GPART or you need to look huh? at it? Well, that's, it's, it isn't visible in GPART, is that correct? The size of the ISO. Like just right off the disk, it, you just see, you know, n number of when blocks. You download, of, when you the download the file, on just do an LS on it. Yeah, so, okay, so at the POSIX level, thank you, okay. The size of the ISO, okay. not the so size of what's on the memory stick. The size of the ISO is what you need to protect. Got it. Now realize that the, the entry that's written there protects the first 4,000 blocks or so, but which are actually inside the ISO, but it won't hurt you. You'll lose a few thousand blocks. Okay. So total's fine or you strip off a few thousand blocks? I actually created it. I, I removed the, what's already covered. So I took the 4,200 and something. Um, let me see. I, there are 4,176 blocks already covered by the GPT that's inside of the ISO image. So I removed those from my computed size of the of the actual ISO image. Got it. Maybe that's just the GPT partition table for hybrid use. Well, yeah, it's it's the GPT that's inside the the, the hybrid image. Got it. It's it's. Andrew, thank you. If you have questions, jump in now before you go. Otherwise, catch you next week. Nope. I'll cool. see you guys later. Have a good weekend. Bye. Okay. Uh, uh, Rod, for what it's worth, I guess Colin would be the one in release engineering to run that by, and I do see how that might be nice to no, add this to is, the official this, hybrid ISO from release is, engineering. This is upscope far above FreeBSD's release engineering team. This is this is of scope of the hybrid ISO in general globally.
This is just this is just a fundamental flaw in the way ISO hybrids are created. Now there may be some reason they're not doing this. Uh, is there any formal official way to produce those, or to have just projects bumbled through it? I'd be totally curious about an official. I believe hybrid. people have actually copied the code that was developed from something called hybrid ISO, which is a, a Sys Linux thing. Ah, okay. Cool. It is a thing. There's a wiki on hybrid ISOs that talks about what it is that you're doing. Cool. Thank you. You're you're embedding the GPT in, in inside of an unused part of the ISO image so that when you write it to a memory stick, EFI can find the GPT or the master boot record can find a, a MBR. It's a thing. Yep. Yeah. Hans, while we have you, uh, do you have any news for, say, TPM emulation support? Yes. Uh, I should be able to finish that, that statement of work that you asked for so long ago. Um, this week, I keep getting interrupted by family. That is a bit of a problem. But You too have <laughs> I will say there was a broad message at free at BSD can that we we collectively, be it individuals, be it foundation, be it project, be it you name it, all really want to be very uh, formal slash aggressive slash structured in making things happen. So please, please, please work on that, and I will help in every way I can because we. Bye. With the Broadcom news, a lot of conversations were about, gee, Broadcom turned down my 25,000 VM deployment and really doesn't want to talk to us. So that was obviously a theme, as it has been for the last few months. Anyway, uh, we touched briefly on AMD development. Looks like nothing yet. Jan, you're brainstorming here in chat. Do you guys have anything about the horror no, show? it's just... HFS. Uh... Ew, no, no, no. <laughs> Um, I've been tinkering on the build option survey. I bumped up the image size. It looks like it needs even another bump for 15. That's my problem, not yours, because no one seems to care about that. But there's one build option tripping up 15 current that I hope to determine. So I've got the epic roaring away in the other in the other room and the garage and you name it to make that happen. Um, I did squeeze in some BSD can topics above such as we, someone mentioned the 9P patches. Mark Johnson mentioned rootless beehive, which some time ago was, oh, that would be hard, followed by, oh, that would be ridiculously useful for CI, for debugging, for a lot of things. So there's that. The antithesis determinator was interesting. I mentioned quiz and put in two links for that. Uh, Dan and Daniel, you not only attended and uh, caught some of that, any points I missed there related to Beehive specifically from BSD can? No, uh, I can't remember anything. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> it was an intense few days. There was somebody well, in watched... a lightning talk doing a lot of oh. pixie stuff. Oh, I uh, missed that entirely to tell. I don't, but I, I don't, I honestly don't remember if it was if it was specifically booting BSD post via via Pixie or booting booting from from them, I I don't remember. Sorry, it's all a blur. No worries, no worries. It should be but, recorded, and off we go. Yeah, it'll be exciting once all that comes out. So, uh -oh. um, yes, Jan. With regards to the Chris uh, talk, which I had to watch from afar. Um, I think uh, your work, uh, Michael, with uh, MakeFS could be useful to basically build a minimal file system to run instead of BF, instead of basically changing the whole boot code, just give it enough of a file system so that the uh, existing UEFI uh, boot from just works. And you still get the uh, workflow that so that you have uh, something that can run unprivileged because it uses MakeFS to then just create a file system which contains a bootloader, a kernel, and whatever user link you need. And uh, run that, and then you can run that in BIF. 
Well, I am using MakeFS and Occam BSD and that reduced the entire like code base by a third. I was so happy when that landed, including ZFS support, which has its own, had its own little bugs and rough edges. You said Chris's talk, which specifically? No, uh, Chris, the talk about the using virtual machines oh, like a process. Precise. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Uh, the quiz talk. Yes, that's exciting. And and yeah, he's he started on KVM and is uh, pretty happy with it. So also watch for that talk. Other topics, John D, how you doing? And speaking of NFS and pixie booting, any lib NFS news, dare I ask? And John D, I was definitely thinking about you with all things IOMMU and actually Kubernetes, that came up quite a bit. Um, just the fact that a bunch of the world sees workloads as Kubernetes and nothing else. You're muted. Maybe you're in a meeting. I don't know. Do, 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 do. Nope, working on ZFS servers and lots of Kubernetes. Well, good luck with that. And any and all insights relate regarding Kubernetes and FreeBSD are appreciated insofar as that's pretty much an initiative of a goal of the enterprise working group. So it's on their radar, even if not listed. Um, other topics, gang, what you got? That was a, some great meat on booting. <laughs> And hopefully the wisdom of the crowd will trickle in. Just one general question for me. Who, who who's mainly doing the ARM sixty four beehive stuff? Is it Andy or is it um somebody else? That moved from UPB to Andy to Mark Johnson, and Mark Johnson's been using Clara ARM sixty four systems to wrap up that work that I learned at so the event. So it's Mark, Mark is, is doing it. Okay, cool. Takes the um, village. And yeah, Mark's been doing great work. And I, well, you were, I don't know if you caught that meeting a week or two back where simply we went through a completely generic install and a generic VM and just started experimenting with different VMs trying to determine their default passwords. No, no, I didn't. Uh, oh. I, I yeah, had to keep up with with all, with all the videos. Um, no, I just tried to run it here with much the same configuration that you uh, tooted um, like a week or two ago. And um, yeah, no luck it at doesn't all, panic. It's, it's some sort of violent CPU um, objection. <laughs> it's all over. It's I like, guess to ask the obvious, uh, it supports the Git V3 or newer? It does. Yeah, it okay. totally does. Yeah. Cool. Uh, it might be time to report that in the various standard channels with a PR, but that's yeah. your call. I, I, I will do. I just got to do a fresh rebuild and then check it again. Um, yeah, I, I've got a serial console, but it doesn't show me anything either. So, yeah, you don't get a crash dump, just power cycles. One thing that came up in, I think, the Fediverse was, gee, it's not very helpful that your CPU model on an ARM system is like the broadest of broad, I don't know, reference model as opposed to the exact <laughs> CPU. Yeah. Um, it's like saying you have a CPU. Yes, it. <laughs> basically. It is not <laughs> Intel. CPU <laughs> Thanks, guys. is square. Good luck. Yeah. Yep. Um, it was, I, I don't know if that's easily fixed, and I'm sure Rebecca has some insights into that, but that's a, that's a point of user frustration, so especially when looking for exact processor features and making a list of which works and which don't work, but it's a journey. Uh, John, yes, I will forward Enterprise Working Group news. There was a meeting right before uh, BSD can, and I'm sure everyone's recoiling from that event. It was a wonderful event. And by recoil, I mean recovering, <laughs> getting back to work. Other topics, news, concerns, funny jokes, t shirt ideas. And heads up 
Antrenig is experimenting with, I don't know how to pronounce it, Galen, Galena, a, a chatting video platform out of Europe, apparently used by universities and other organizations, plus Collabra Office to do the Google Docs replacement. So that is in that the future, Galen. Galen. I'll go. That's candidate pronunciation. The FreeBSD project supports that on its website as a general chat thing, and there's a FreeBSD client for it. Correct. That's exactly it. So I might want to move to that at some point. The one thing it's missing, correct, is uh, remote screen control, which is quite the challenge on almost all platforms, even Zoom and Windows 11, which has issues. So heads up. Looking at and faults. Uh, if someone has some experience with that, we may want to turn to you and get questions answered. If you're really feeling spicy, you could add remote screen sharing, and that would just change a whole lot of things. Take care, Santiago. Have a great one. So that's not something you would just add. That's my I, sardonic, Especially not if you ironic to, comment. Yes, uh, I know. Rock on different platforms without just saying your web browser has to do it for you. Yeah, and Jitsi specifically disabled that code because it was so risky. Daniel, anything else, Bell? Anything new in VM related? Anything exciting? Um, I'm a little interested. I'm actually very interested in the SRI of these stuff, um, but I don't think I can make much progress right now, but I'll be testing. So um, have you, was that interesting Mark it, McBride? Or you just, go ahead. Oh, there's that interesting Mark McBride uh, bug that... Uh, that link, 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 link. Uh, um, it's, it's in the doc. It's, oh, in, okay. the, it's in the doc. So... Um, so yeah, the, the, apparently there's if you if you try to use it with jail and beehive under well who knows what conditions, it it does not work, it crashes the network. So um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that because I I would need jail and beehive to work at the same same time with that. So that's interesting. And then the other thing beehive related I'm doing is is you know, because I have too much time on my hands, apparently. Uh, I'm trying to get Plan 9 working in Beehive, and there is Doc on their Beehive. website, but I can't, I can't get the mouse working. Do Everybody I just type in XHCI? Really? Um, to make X... The question is, which mode do they support? Um, do you want relative or absolute coordinates? I literally don't care as long as the mouse works. I'm willing to suffer. Yeah, try both. With... Uh, one is the default, the other may rock. <laughs> yeah, no, none of the options. Well, it gives me a list of options and none of those work. So I have to figure out what to type maybe. Um, all right. Well, anyway, I'll figure, I'll figure it out one day. How, how That's booting with UEFI or something else? Grub or something crazy? Uh, UAFI. Yeah, it works fine. So it works, streamloads. Yeah, I just can't get the mouse to work and you can't use nine front uh, or plan nine without a mouse. It doesn't oh, really? happen. Uh, yeah, it is a it is a graphically yeah, it is a graphically dependent operating system. And have you tried it with and without the tablet mode yep. emulation? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, I know people are using it, so I, I just have to figure out which combination. I mean, honestly, it's probably I have to type something that is not well documented on their wiki. So, uh, my first my first goal then will be to edit their wiki and say what's missing. Sure. Well, we look forward to that demo. Do they have a browser to edit the wiki? Actually, no. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> You can do your own uh, put statements, commands, and other. I games. hear they have compilers now. Ooh, um, okay. And there's a dude. There's a dude writing um, uh, GFS, which is a ZFS implementation that is uh, that is insanely portable and um, networked. So uh, I'll be I'll be interested in that project, which I have no idea what that could yield, but but that's. That's interesting, but anyway, I, I you know we've talked a little bit about the 
Plan 9 FS stuff. And so I thought I'd jump head first in and take a look. And there was a friendly guy at a nice bug last night that was really talking it up. Would that be Ori, who's done talks on Plan 9? Not dead, just resting. And GEFF, <laughs> good enough file system? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, I've seen both those talks, um, or at least watched my mind. Uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't that guy, but it was a different guy. Okay. But uh, that told me about it. But yeah, I, I've I've met Ori, um, and yeah, it's uh, yeah infectious interest in um, research operating systems. Let's say uh, with so, a business use case or just kind of having fun. Well, I mean, there were some exciting ideas with Plan Nine FS, right? We could, we could, well, you, you know, have a have file system available to, um, you know, to host and share between VMs in a in a more seamless way. That could be interesting. Um, so I don't know. There's there's definitely. I think I think there's just a lot of there's a lot of technology that's grown out of um, the Plan Nine legacy. So. Oh. Um, so seeing that on the ground floor as, you know, as we BSD type people like to do sometimes, I thought I'd get a little more acquainted. Uh, Jan, tell us about that nine front link on the wiki for Beehive. Uh, uh, just oh. noticed that the FreeBSD wiki, that the FreeBSD wiki has uh, a page on nine front in Beehive. Search for mouse. It's, yeah, it's identical. <laughs> it's identical to the one on the nine front page, um, wow. and it doesn't. It doesn't say what to type for the which I, I mean, I, I I can already see it. I'm going to type the letters X H C I, and it's going to work. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I'll have more to report on uh, next week, maybe. Cool. Okay. Well, good luck with that. Good find. And you linked a video. Is that one of those same nice bug one? I'll be what you got. Oh, don't randomly go to there. We go. Nice bug. Yes. Yeah, I was, I think it was, yeah, I was at this talk. It was interesting. Alrighty then. And this bug. The... Can you hear me, Michael? Yes, sir. Much better. Welcome. Just a quick comment about writing a script for shutdown. Um, Ooh, yes. I sim I sim link uh, rc dot shutdown dot local to a uh, a shutdown script that just issues a, a power off on all of the VMs or a power soft on the VMs. So you uh, rephrase that, uh, say that again from the RC script. What is that, Matt? Um, <clears throat> I did something pretty straightforward a few years back. I just I sim link. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, no, slash Etsy uh, RC dot shutdown dot local. You're familiar with RC dot local? Yeah. Uh, There's an RC dot shutdown dot local. Yeah, get uh, rid of the D and get rid of the. Getting there, getting there, getting there you go. Yeah, I sim link that to a to a, a very short binary that uh, sends a, a soft off. ACPI power down to the Beehive VMs. Um, that said, how are you? And not what are your advantages? I'm sorry, there were uh, multiple people what? talking. How are you getting precisely the right VM, be it by process, by name, by other? Because it was never supported by Beehive Control, which is, it turns out, been a bit frustrating. I have, remember, I have my own cool. VM management facility and I track all of the, the Beehive processes with unique serial number and PID. Got it. Go ahead, Jan. So um, you could do an F stat on the VMM device. So the user space command F stat hmm. uh, to find out who has it open, which PID. It's not the fastest way to do it, but um, that's a clever one. Okay. Or uh, because Beehive runs as root, you could uh, just say there's only one process with this uh, argument list and uh, user ID zero supposed to be in the current zone, basically. 
a non jail not in a not a sub sub jail so you can target that but yeah that relies on the fact that mm, there are no arbitrary stray processes supposed to run as root uh, which just find it funny to spoof the argument list for beehive argument list as in how invocated invocated or something yes. else Yes, Aren't you can maps? do an exact ma match against the uh, the process title, basically. Oh, but that's just no, not uh, just oh. with pika. You, you can do pika l dash x dash f and so on. Um, you can narrow it down so that it. That no process which does not run as root is not jailed and really wants to be shot uh, really die the same death as Beehive um, mm. gets signaled. So, but yeah, it's it works, but it's not clean. Right, and I thought it was masking the arguments now in recent Beehive, but I could be wrong. Happy exactly. Say. And because of that, you have a unique process title. I see. Independent, which matches no matter how BIF has been invoked. Ah. Cool. Well, it's then. only BIF colon space guest name. Uh, space what name? Colon space and then the guest name. All right. Exactly. It changes this process title to that always, no matter which command line arguments you gave it. Hmm. Yeah, you can do an exact match against that. Uh, as long as it's not like zero one and zero one one, and you go after zero one and get them both. But you no, know, you do an exact match, oh, as exact. in no, no substring match, an exact match. <laughs> there's a flag for that in pgrep and pico. Oh, got it. And there's never one to match against the full argument list, and not just the zero. Of one and if you use both you can cool yeah anything else or shall we call it at approximately a moose draw an hour and a half well thank you everyone i'll be around a few minutes and we lost chris but don't forget to like and subscribe and i say that somewhat ironically but uh should YouTube ever want to throw money at us? Apparently, we need more either followers or more, I believe, listened, what, viewed hours. But I'm not going to get hung up on those things. I will get hung up on ILM and Muse. Thank you, everyone.